Hello, everyone. I am so, so excited to have Dr. Laura Anderson on the show today. This is an interview I've been doing, wanting to do for a long time, and I've had her on my list, and her team reached out, so I was so excited. But for those who do not know her, she's the founder for the Center for Trauma Resolution and Recovery, and she focuses uh, her areas on research and supervisory approach within the realm of complex trauma, which also relates to religious trauma, sexualized violence, domestic violence, dynamics of power and control in relationships and systems, and also a narcissistic family dynamic. So, so, so many things. Yes. And uh, how are you doing today? I'm so good. It's so lovely to be here with you. I've been very excited for this interview. Uh, thank you. I've been so excited for this interview too. And to just hear your story and also your expertise in the area of religious trauma. And I'm so excited also because you have a book coming out later this year. Do you want to dig a little bit yeah. into what that's about? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I do have a book. It's coming out October 17th, 2023. Um, it is called When Religion Hurts You, Healing from Religious Trauma and the Impact of High Control Religion. I'm really excited because I think it's the first of its kind. Uh, it's not a prescriptive model of like, here's how you have to heal. Um, but it talks, the first kind of section of the book talks a lot about what is religious trauma, what are adverse religious experiences, spiritual abuse, what is the nervous system, this whole like healing thing. And then the bulk of the book, like, I think it's like the last nine chapters of the book is actually research taken from my dissertation and it's themes of healing. So when I was um, like part of my doctoral work was I wanted to understand healing better, like healing from trauma better. You know, so many times we, we hear this, like in our conversation, like, oh, I'm healed, right? Like I just need to heal from this. Mm -hmm. And I've had my own experiences with religious trauma, domestic violence, sexualized violence. And I had this idea of like, okay, if I can just get to this point, I'm going to be healed. And in my mind to be healed then meant like all that stuff is in the past. It doesn't impact me at all. And what I struggled with was that um, when I set this goal of like, this is what it means to be healed, I felt like it was getting further and further away. Um, like I would, I would do X, Y, Z, and then this other thing would pop up. And, and so it was like, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm constantly like having to fix myself and there's no end point. In fact, the end point keeps getting further away. And my dissertation chair one day like said, hey, what if we looked at your definition of healing? Maybe that's what's limiting you here, both personally as well as professionally and pushing kind of some of this research forward. And, and so I was like, oh, I don't like that because if I have this alternate definition of healing, then it means these things that I want to, to indicate that I'm healed, like maybe that's not going to happen. So there's a bit of a grief process there. Yeah. But ultimately, as I sat with this idea of like, what is healing and what does it look like to be a person who's like living a healing life? It all of a sudden started to open up all these doors and recognizing that healing is this like essentially lifelong process but it happens in these small moments where something happens and we respond in a little bit of a different way. And that's a moment of healing, right? Where you go, wow, like two weeks ago, I wouldn't have responded that way, but I can celebrate the fact that like this thing happened. And so it's giving kind of this openness that instead of like just trying to get to this fixed point that we can look for that in our everyday life. And so out of that kind of inquiry came nine themes of going when we're living in a healing body, um, which is ongoing this uh, and, and a complex process. Like here's some of the things that we start to notice. And it's everything from like kind of deconstructing our identity and reconstructing that or reconstructing our worldview, things like embodiment, stabilizing your nervous system, reclaiming your sexuality, grieving, feeling all your emotions, connecting to other people. And so what I did is I took that research and I said, okay, so in a religious high control religion environment, how did that impact our sexuality? And what does it look like to live in a healing body as we're, you know, like healing our sexuality? Um, how did it impact the relationships that we have? 
And what does it look like to heal and live in a healing body it, within the context of relationships? And so I go through that with several different themes. So that's kind of like a, the tip of the iceberg, but you know, de definition of my book, but um, I'm excited for it to come out because um, you like we we're talking about earlier before we started recording is like, I, I'm somebody who's always been a person who like wants to provide resources for other people that I may not have had. I started my deconstruction process, gosh, like 15 or 17 years ago, the internet was not a thing. Well, I mean, social media wasn't a thing. The internet was, but, um, you know, I, I, I didn't have access to even other people that were going through things like this. I truly thought perhaps I was the only one who had had experiences like this. And so the idea that I get to create a resource that could even help just like one person feel a little bit less alone or a little bit less daunted by this like deconstruction process or healing process feels really exciting. And I hope that it can be a source of like hope and encouragement for um, anybody who's coming out of these high control religions. Uh, thank you so much for eloquently explaining that and condensing it. And really what I heard from that is you are exploring or really sharing all the different aspects of how this trauma affects a person and their lives, like the totality yeah. of it. And I don't think anyone has done that. Yeah. To my knowledge, they haven't. And thank you mm -hmm. for like catching that because the thing with trauma is that it is so multidimensional in regard to mm -hmm. how it impacts you. And so in all of our research, we you know, people focus on like symptom reduction or alleviation, which of course is part of what we're hoping will happen with like resolving trauma, but they're not hitting it on these multidimensional levels of going mm -hmm. when things like high control religion are your normal, <laughs> like it impacts you in a really significant way. And so coming out of that is complex. And there's a lot of different areas of life that have to be addressed in order to, you know, like feel like you can function in a different way um, mm -hmm. outside of fundamentalist systems. Yes. Yes. And so for people listening, could you explain and define what is trauma and how it affects a person, like their body, their mind, their perceptions and everything? Yeah, such a great question, like the perfect place to start because it can lead into like religious trauma and all those things. There's unfortunately not like a succinct definition of like, this is what trauma is. But typically the way that I just do, um, talk about it is trauma is anything that's too much, too fast, too soon that overwhelms mm -hmm. our ability to cope and return back to a sense of safety. Um, and that's going to be subjective from person to person. So what might uh, throw your nervous system out of whack may or may not throw my nervous system out of whack. Trauma is very subjective. It's not the thing that happened to you, but it's the way that your body or your nervous system responds to the thing that happens to you. I think that's a really important piece when we're talking about trauma, because prior to the last 20 to 30 years, colloquially, we thought of trauma as this thing. It is the car accident. It's the natural disaster. It's the experience of war, the sexualized violence. And so there is some prescription around that. Like if you've experienced this big thing, here's the results. Like you're going to experience all of these other things, hypervigilance, depression, anxiety, social things. Okay. And what happened there is there was a group of, you know, like lots of people who were like, yeah, I experienced this, but I don't have those symptoms. So am I suppressing them? Am I numbing them? Like what's happening? And simultaneously, there's all these other people who are experiencing all those symptoms, but they're like, but I didn't have that big thing that happened to me. I, I wasn't in a war. I wasn't in a natural disaster. And so where researchers went with that was understanding trauma in a, on a physiological level and recognizing that trauma is not in our mind. It's not a thing. It's, it's how our our body, our nervous system responds to that thing. It becomes flooded and activated and overwhelmed um, to the point where our normal coping mechanisms may not work for us. And if we don't have a chance to find a sense of safety after that real perceived or remembered threat has um, dissolved, then that energy can kind of stick in our bodies and um, it can turn into PTSD or CPTSD or a whole host of other physiological and psychological symptoms um, that, you know, can really wreak havoc on our lives, relationships, bodies, 
everything. Um, I know that's not like a super succinct way to define trauma, uh, but that's a little bit about what it is. No, I think that was a fantastic definition. And I love how you really dug into the nuance and subject subjectivity of it, because I think you've seen this, I've seen this, of so many survivors invalidated for their own trauma when someone comes along and they're like, hey, I was also in that religious environment and that didn't yeah. affect me at all. Yes. And yes. you have this mm-hmm. sense of shame of like, oh my gosh, like, and you kind of feel gaslit too. You're like, mm-hmm. oh, well, they didn't experience this. Maybe I didn't experience that. Yes. Maybe I'm crazy, maybe, or maybe, and then people are, they'll say, oh, you're just so sensitive. You're just mm-hmm. this, this, and yeah. this, or things like that. And and, and that is an interesting thing because as I've left toxic religion, there are some people that have reached out to me when I called out the specific church that I grew up in. And they're like, oh, they're mm-hmm. like, I was in that too. That was an awful experience. It traumatized mm-hmm. me too. I'm so sorry. And then some people were like, reached out. That didn't affect me at all. Yeah. And that was yes. so interesting yeah. to me. I, yeah. I think that's so important that you're hitting on it because you're right. I have experienced that with different people who've come in and in and out of my life. I'll get the comment a lot. Well, like I wasn't um, sexually abused by a member of the clergy, but yet I'm having all these symptoms, but I can't be traumatized because this thing didn't happen to me. Mm -hmm. And what I always tell them is that subjectivity piece is that religion unto itself is not trauma. Hell like the teaching, the doctrine of te- uh, that we were taught of hell, that's not trauma. How our bodies responded to that teaching or any teaching really, or doctrine or practice or relationship, that is what determines if it results in trauma or not. I have multiple siblings. We were all taught the same thing. We grew up in the same church. We have the same parents. And the way that my little five-year-old body perceived the doctrine of hell was very different than how one of my siblings did. And I responded with extreme terror. It impacted me on multiple levels. Whereas my sibling was like, "Eh, not a big deal. So does that mean that one's better or worse? No, it just means we have different resources. We experience things differently and what impacts them is different than what impacts me. Likewise, they might have something that's really Mm -hmm. impactful for them. And I'm like, yeah, it's not that big of a deal to me. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important we don't get into comparing like, oh, well, whatever, because that always brings shame. Exactly what you're saying. Like, well, was I really traumatized? Was I not? And I think it's it's so important to recognize like, perhaps you were. (laughs) Like, I, I I don't know because I don't know that person, right? Like maybe I'm not living inside your body though. So I don't know what the experience of that is. But if you're telling me like, hey, I, this is, I feel really traumatized by this, you know, and I'm, I can't sleep or I can't be out in public or this, like, who am I to doubt that? Like, that's your experience. And I think it's really important because we do have it invalidated, especially as Southerners who, you know, like the first question after somebody asks your name is what church do you go to? Right. Yeah. Um, and so this idea, like religion is very accepted. We don't talk negatively about it. If you had a bad experience, it was just your experience is a bad church experience and people are imperfect, but God is perfect, you know, and there's all these ways around it yeah. that really can mess with you and really devalidate. I don't even know if that's a word or invalidate. Um, your experience so that like what you said, am I it's almost like you're gaslighting yourself? Um, yes. Which of course then compounds on what you've already experienced. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for delving into that. And oh my gosh, like you bring up those phrases. They're so common for yeah. these environments. Yeah. And this is so annoying. It's like, oh, people did that. God didn't do that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah well, people in the name of God, whatever you want to say, right? Like, yeah, it can be really dangerous. And even if it was quote unquote, just people, they're doing it in the name of God. They're doing it with spiritual authority. They're doing it with these dynamics of power and control. And it really does impact in, in usually negative ways. Mm -hmm. And yes. And for people listening, could you define religious trauma? Yeah. So 
religion, when we talk about religious trauma, I always say religious trauma is trauma, which is why I love that you started with the question that you did because religion in this, you know, the term religious trauma just kind of acts as a bit of an adjective that helps us further understand where the trauma originated from. And so it means two things. It means that in terms of how trauma lives in our body, it's the same as the soldier from war, the person who experienced childhood, uh, you know, uh, abuse, neglect, you know, developmental trauma, the car accident, things like that. How our physiology responds, like in those um, traumatic experiences, is very sa- very similar to regardless of where it's stemming from. Does that piece make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. The the part where it's a little bit different is um, the religious piece helps us understand the context and therefore what we might need to address in healing. So what I might compare it to is when we say, okay, this person has trauma, let's say from war, uh, this person has trauma from their religious experiences. Um, we might need to uh, work with the person who has experienced trauma from religious context, maybe on developing a new identity outside of fundamentalism, kind of part of their recovery piece, right? Whereas Mm -hmm. perhaps the person who is at war doesn't need that. Now we might have to work with them on like how to handle when a car backfires and they get really, really agitated. Whereas maybe the person who is coming out of a traumatic religious experience, it's like, yeah, that's not a thing for me, right? So the word religious just kind of helps us clue us into maybe some of the unique or specific things that we might need to work on in the recovery process. Um, Mm -hmm. But it does not necessarily shift the way that we would resolve how the trauma is living in the body, which I know can feel really confusing, but it it actually gives us more options for treatment Uh if we can view it that way, rather than this separate entity that needs special treatment, special models, special Mm -hmm. interventions specifically for this. It's like, no, we can draw from all this really wonderful trauma research and interventions and models and use that for religious trauma. And then we can say, oh, also, here's probably some things that are going to impact you because of this religious piece that may not impact other people. And we can tailor it a little bit better there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. So it's like the context that it happened in and addressing that specific context. Mm And it's interesting to me because I think one of the things with religious trauma is this is not the case for everyone, but I think wanting to have that connection to some kind of higher power and that's kind of cut Mm -hmm. off. Do you feel like that's something that psychotherapists are trained in to help people who want Mm -hmm. a vital spirituality and have and find meaning in that? You know, not really. I don't think so. Traditionally, like in, at least in the United States, when therapists are trained academically, there's kind of this overall belief that religion is a, what's considered like a pro-social or supportive factor in a person's Mm -hmm. life. So this is something that people can delve into where they might receive a sense of support or connection or identity. And Mm -hmm. certainly it can be that for some people, but traditionally therapists aren't taught that religion would ever really be a harmful uh, entity Mm -hmm. um, with the exception of the occasional clergy abuse or the occasional religious cult, right? Like Mm -hmm. you're taught about kind of some of these extreme things that would happen, but not really like the the day-to-day high control religion that so many people have grown up in and Um, well into their adult years. And so I don't think that therapists and um, other mental health professionals are necessarily trained on spotting religious trauma. And they're also not trained on like how to help somebody develop their own spirituality, whatever that might be, if it's mm-hmm. different than theirs. Um, for a long time, up until probably the last five or six years, one of the themes within religious trauma recovery was become an atheist. That's how you recover from religious trauma. And for some people, that might be important. It might yeah. be important to deconvert entirely from all religion. It might be important to become an atheist, renounce your faith, live, you know, or find a totally different religion or something like that. That could be a possibility. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think to suggest that that's what you have to do in order to heal from religious trauma, 
could be or could easily become a form of fundamentalism, just kind of on the other side of the spectrum. So I think that therapists are now starting to learn about this, but I think this idea of like helping a client figure out what their spirituality, if any, is that may be different from where they started or the therapist's own beliefs. I don't know that that's necessarily um, discussed. And I think the other piece of that is, of course, as therapists, we are not supposed to bring in our own beliefs and values and impose those on the clients, which is great in theory. However, we're humans. And so it happens, right? But I think when we're talking about faith in particular, that's such a personal thing. And oftentimes people find their identity in it. And so it's not uncommon then for a therapist to be sitting with a client who's potentially you know, like deconstructing from their faith or deconverting and the therapist getting a bit offended and maybe even kind of projecting that onto their clients or really trying to steer their clients back to the Bible or a church or a pastor, whatever it might be. Um, and that can be really, really harmful for somebody coming mm-hmm. out of these contexts. Yes. Yes, mm-hmm. most definitely. Yeah. yeah. It was interesting for me because when I left high control religion, I found a therapist that actually went to Bob Jones University. Oh, wow. Wow. Yes. (laughs) And so I remember like doing my free consultation. I was like, hey, like, my name is actually a pleasure. I'm like, are you even familiar with religious trauma? That's a thing. Yeah. I want to see what they would think about it. I think that's such a great question. Yeah. And so they're like, yeah, they're like, I am familiar with religious trauma. And I've had clients who've experienced that. And he's like, he's like, you know, I usually don't reveal personal information about myself, but because of this situation, I'm going to. And he was like, I went to Bob Jones University and he's like, and I left it because of how harmful it was. And wow. so, yeah. And my, my, my um, therapist, he had studied biblical counseling for a little bit at Bob mm-hmm. Jones and that's mm-hmm. what made him leave. And yes. he, he told me, he's like, yeah, it's like, I I get it. And I was like, all right, see you in the office next week. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) What a gift. I mean, like such like, like you found a unicorn right off the bat in the sense of like somebody who under understood like generally religious Mm -hmm. trauma, but then could understand your experience a bit more specifically, like with Bob Jones it's so uncommon <laughs> to like mm-hmm. pick up the phone and find somebody, which is why I started my company in the first place. But I love that you had that experience because, because so many people do have the opposite experience where they are told this was just the bad church experience or, or whatever sort of like invalidating or shameful response. And it just really could harm people so much more. And so I just like, oh, it warms my heart that you found uh... somebody because that, I mean, even if you even if it didn't work out with them, just like having that little piece of validation of like, wow, okay, I'm not making this up. Here's at least one other person who had a similar experience because of the environment that I had. And so I can at least put that in my back pocket and know, like, I think I'm on the right track here, which Mm -hmm. is incredible. Yes, I know. Like, I I was so, so thrilled. Um, And like you said, I love how you said unicorn, because like, he was just a rare... (laughs) thing yeah. that just stumbled upon oh. and it's been great and like we've right. he's been my therapist for over a year now so he's still my That's therapist so and we've like built that relationship so I'm so happy mm. about That's that good. um and something that I was curious about um was can you explain kind of the difference between spiritual slash religious abuse versus religious trauma yes excellent question so I made that statement earlier, like trauma is not the thing that happens to you, but it's our body, our nervous system's response to the thing that happens to us. I would say the thing could be religious or spiritual abuse or like an adverse religious experience. Mm -hmm. So um, what I, what we should say is religious or spiritual abuse or adverse religious experience does not equal trauma, but it Mm -hmm. certainly can result in trauma. So um, we Spiritual abuse, religious abuse, adverse religious experiences um, could be anything from like different teachings, practices, relationships that you were required to be a part of that you had to, or else there would be consequences. Um, 
It could be the messaging that you've heard, you know, like I think about, I grew up in a very like reformed Calvinist church. And so like the message of like, you're utterly depraved from the time you're born, you're not worthy, you're uh, inherently sinful. Like you don't think about a, there's no alternative to that. Like that's all you've ever known. Right. But you don't think about like how that impacts you on like a cellular level, like your whole body believes that. And so for, for some people that would obviously be considered a religious, like religious abuse or spiritual abuse or religious abuse of messaging. There's a whole bunch of like ways you could categorize it. And for me, that resulted in trauma or that played into my religious trauma, the way that that message landed in my body and then what it, how I lived in that. Now, there might be other people who would say that messaging didn't really impact me, but this practice over here or this experience where like I witnessed this altar call or this scary sermon or whatever it might be. When we're talking about things like abuse or adverse religious experiences, we're t- typically talking about like a thing, like a, a something that something that happened to you, something maybe tangible that you can point to a little bit mm-hmm. more. Um, and myself, as well as some colleagues, um, kind of have a hypothesis that the more adverse religious experiences that you have endured, the l- the greater the likelihood is that it would result in trauma. And that is based off of research from what's called the adverse childhood experiences uh, study, which kind of um, underpins like our, what we know about complex and developmental trauma. And so we use kind of that research to make this hypothesis. It's not fully mm-hmm. empirically validated yet. There is research being done, but it's this idea that the more or the more intense they are, the likely, the greater the likelihood that it would result in trauma with the one caveat of going, we also have to recognize because everybody's body is different. They may have had one you know, adverse religious experience that resulted in trauma, whereas somebody else may have had 200 (laughs) and it didn't result in trauma. So we want, we want to leave that subjectivity there. Um, but that's just kind of our working hypothesis. Mm, Yes. And like, for me, when I kind of like embarked on my healing journey, what was so helpful to me was when I read that religious trauma is comparable to complex PTSD. Mm -hmm. And it's really what you've explained about all the different traumas that happen one on top of another Mm -hmm. and it builds and it builds. And that really helped, I guess you would say, demystify it a lot. Yeah, that's a good word. I, (laughs) I didn't realize. So when I figured out the whole complex PTSD part, I was sitting in a, a therapy session with my therapist many years ago and she was great. Um, and it, I think we thought we were talking the same language, but I was so in my experience and she was observing it so she could have this other perspective. And she just kind of like casually said something like, you know, people that have complex PTSD, blah, 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 and like kept going on. And I was like, wait, what? Say that again, complex PTSD. She's like, well, you do know that that's what you have, right? And I was like, uh, Now I do. And and like all the puzzle pieces started to come together because I was like, of course I do. Like I could see, I could see all the diagnostic lists and all of a sudden I was like, I check every one of those boxes, but there is something really nice about having some framework like that. Like you said, it kind of demystifies this experience that we've had because it gives language. It helps to, I think it takes some shame away Mm-hmm. Where it's like, oh, wow, like I'm not making this up. It was that bad. These responses that I'm having are not inflated s- simply for the fact of being inflated, right? Like mm-hmm. there is something that's causing these. And I know for myself personally, receiving a diagnosis of CPTSD was one of the most pivotal moments in my own healing process. Mm. Wow, that's so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. And yeah. I love how you really like acknowledge like the nuance of everyone's experiences and there's so much complexity. Oh, uh, I see your yeah. dog in the background. Oh. <laughs> so yes, adorable. I, <laughs> I made her sit in here with me because otherwise she'll just like bark at random things. So I was like, Phoebe, you're sitting on the couch. That's so <laughs> adorable. Yeah. 
Oh, <laughs> anyway, sorry, I got distracted. I was like, dog. It's okay. <laughs> it's all good. She loves the attention. <laughs> but um, I think something that really I've been, as I really thought about and kind of researched a little bit in my undergrad was really the idea of like intersectionality mm-hmm. of the overlapping of social identities and how our social identities are treated in Mm -hmm. certain environments and for me like as a queer person being in that religious environment I know that my queer identity because of that and the messages that they taught combined cause a lot of like religious trauma or Mm -hmm. some people would say just queer trauma from that experience so that was something so then there would be people who would come to me and be like oh I didn't experience this and I'm thinking I'm like, well, I know you're straight, <laughs> so <laughs> yes, I can understand. Yeah. And I'm not yeah. saying that people who are straight can't experience religious trauma. There are so many ways people yeah. can. Mm-hmm. I just want to emphasize that. But that was something I noticed when I got online. I saw a lot of people who had religious mm-hmm. trauma, and they were also in the LGBTQ plus community. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I saw that correlation, and I was like, oh, like that makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah. You know, one of the things that um, I talk to a lot of clients about and do education around is what I call dynamics of power and control within religion. And um, I created this uh, resource called like the religious power and control wheel, which full disclosure, like the idea is in, it's inspired from uh, uh, it's called the Duluth model. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a company or group. I I don't even know what they are. LLC maybe uh, that has worked with domestic violence for decades. Um, They're kind of the group that put domestic violence like on the map in terms of it being a thing. And one of the things that they found was that in domestically violent relationships, there's oftentimes all these little behaviors and things that are happening over time that if you just isolate, you know, just like one of those things, it's like, oh, that's not that bad, right? Like, oh, I've done that too. So like one of the categories is like minimizing, denying, and blaming. Well, what person has not minimized what they've, you know, like done to somebody else or blamed Mm -hmm. somebody else or um, denied, no, that didn't happen, right? And so you go, okay, there's some very human behaviors on here and you go, okay, but that's not abusive, right? To like, just blame somebody for this, you know, one time. But what we started to see within the domestic violence world was that these behaviors were happening like a lot and they were a lots of them were happening together so that over time similar what you're talking about complex trauma we're like stacking them up on each other right Mm, and all of a sudden then what we're starting to notice is there's this dynamic of power and control so one person in the relationship is in the role of being able to control and have power over another individual their actions maybe what they dress how they speak where they go who they interact with and that's that would usually be present before there would be any sort of like more overt abuse, like physical or sexualized uh, violence and abuse. And so I understood that as a therapist, that's actually where I started working was with domestic violence. I have a background in that as well on a personal level. And Mm. I started to recognize personally I don't know, like who said this, was this my abusive partner or was this God? Like, I first heard the message of I'm unworthy from God, but then my partner also echoed that. So it wasn't hard to believe him when he would say that. Right. And so we, I started to apply those kind of things to religious contexts that were high control, a lot of having power over. And so I think what's important coming back to this intersectional question is going, um, in religious systems, they're they're a very patriarchal system, and at least in the you know Western world, uh, typically the person at the top of that patriarchal system is going to be the cisgender heterosexual white man, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And then everybody else kind of falls in line under that. But that person or people at the top are the ones who get to determine. Here's what you do. Here's what you don't do. Here's the consequences when you do the thing that you're not supposed to do. And they start to dictate every area of life. And then we put God on top of that. And they say, well, this is from God, right? And so the Bible says this. And so all these little areas of control are now also tied to this higher power. And so when they say, you know, it's a sin to be gay, like Mm. they're invoking this higher power, they're invoking this patriarchal power, and they're going... 
I mean, okay, like, I guess, yeah, because here I see it in the Bible, you know, and so I have to kind of squash that within myself. And, and some people end up at the spot where we're like, okay, well, it's not that bad. Like, you know, I just, I have to be celibate for the rest of my life. And that's just what I'm going to do. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, but then they don't see like, oh, but they're also squashing me here and here and here and here. And all of a sudden my entire life is dictated by these other external sources. And we have this dynamic of power and control. And on top of that, if I were to say no or push back, there's severe consequences, including, but not limited to an eternal conscious torment in hell. So it keeps you in there. And so when we look at that intersection piece, depending on where you fall on that ladder, how close you are to being the cisgender heterosexual white man, like there's differing consequences and differing freedoms and different constrictions that are placed on you in order to keep you in line. Mm, you explained that so, so well. And I, I love it because um, for me, that was something that I had to really dig into was that power dynamic because yeah. it was all I knew. And I was always taught, this is the way it's supposed to be. Yes. This is what God says. And me questioning mm -hmm. that patriarchal, patriarchal hierarchical system and being like, you know what, this layout of power is abusive in and mm -hmm. of itself. And it causes yeah. so much abuse to happen. And it was interesting because also thinking about how like on the like the macro system of the religious context and then the, like the more macro system or micro system of the family mm -hmm. of the fundamentalist family yes yes absolutely it's just it's a it's like a mirror right like mm -hmm. you do you know like we've talked about our our mutual friend tia you uh, know and i yes. i i'm sure she was talking about this like you know this idea of like, we went to this church that was like extremely fundamentalist and extremely patriarchal, but it didn't just stop at church services on a Sunday, right? When she would get in the car and go home with her husband and children, it carried over into that. Everything that was talked about on that macro level was played out in the micro level. And, and that was, you know, the family piece, but that also happens individually with, you know, people of all differing identities of this idea of like, you know, the church goes, well, you know, that we teach this because it's the godly thing to do, but they can kind of wash their hands. Like, you know, if, if like, if that means, oh, you, this person engages in this like abusive behavior, they can be like, well, we didn't actually say that, but we could, we could make the jump from like how our teachings would have brought forth that behavior. Does that make sense? Yeah, it definitely does. And it just, it kills me how this patriarchal hierarchical system is constantly defended, defended. And it's like, oh, this is man. Yeah. It's, you know, it's not God. And it's like, this system is not working. There's no accountability for people on the top. Mm -hmm. And, you know, God is supposed to be on top. So it's yes. like, there's, there's nothing. Zero. <laughs> nothing going on there yeah. god's not telling yeah. them to do anything yeah. <laughs> but i know it's like the it's such it's like uh i've I have many curse words to describe it Ooh. i won't say them today yeah <laughs> <laughs> but you're right right you know isn't it amazing how in these systems like god echoes the loudest voices of the leaders yes you know like it's so amazing that like you know, Doug Wilson, you know, I don't know if you know who he is, but like he's this familiar. super patriarchal. Yeah. And somehow God has his voice. You like God's voice is Doug Wilson's voice, but God's voice is also Louis Giglio's voice, who is like the head of passion conferences and stuff like that. And it's, so it's like, oh, that's so interesting. Like, you know, yeah, God, God is the head, but like, he sounds an awful lot like Doug, um, you know, like those <laughs> sorts of things. <laughs> yes. Yes. And really, and again, these systems, they're all about that power and that control mm -hmm. because what I've learned from my own family and even witnessing it at Bob Jones, the people, people lower down the ladder, it doesn't matter. They don't matter. Their needs don't matter. Their opinions, their emotions, anything they've gone through, 
Yeah. It is prioritized to make the group seem like it's together and hide yeah. anything that communicates otherwise. It's all about the yes. reputation mm -hmm. and the power and control yeah. that they want mm -hmm. over these people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because they, of course, they hide it and they show this beautiful front that really mm -hmm. appeals to our natural human desires, things like connection and safety and stability. I think that's what churches quote unquote get right because they speak to a very human need. They just yeah. do it in a way that's very detrimental because it's not just that. You can't come into that system and just be who you are. There's expectations in order to stay with the group. And that can just, that's really hard because oftentimes churches, especially like larger churches can offer resources to people that they desperately need. You know, you think about like the single mother who now has access to like mom's day out and babysitters that are low cost or no cost. Like what a blessing for them to have that, yeah. but it comes with a cost. Um, and that's what they don't talk about. Mm, yes. And that's interesting that you mentioned that because I recently saw an inst or a Facebook live from someone and they were ranting and that they live in Greenville where I live. They were ranting about this homeless shelter that is run by a Christian organization. Okay. And they were like, there's this woman, she was at this homeless shelter and she'd rather be homeless. She left it. And if she went to the streets, she'd rather be homeless than being in this homeless shelter because they're stuffing this strict fundamentalist wow. Christian yeah. agenda down her throat mm -hmm. in order for her needs. So yeah, so they provide her needs, but she has to go to these Bible classes or yes. claim yeah. to believe certain things, which is not loving at all. Yeah. It's 100% so control. It is 100% yeah. control. And so she she ended up being on the streets because she's like, I don't want to do that. And mm -hmm. I think that's something that a lot of these groups promote. Oh, we're this like gospel centered, Bible centered, whatever. And it's like, not really <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like that just, you know, um, yeah, it's just, my mind is going a million different places with that. Cause it's like, it's just, it's not okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> like that's mm -hmm. the simplest way to say it. It's just not okay. What's happening. Mm. And it was interesting because when I really started, as I've been working on my own book and just about my own experiences, there was something I noticed and it's something, I can't remember the verse in the Bible, but I noticed that, oh my gosh, these Christians are being loving and kind to people who are just like them and think just like them. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it's it's not really that hard to do that. And I know it was interesting because yeah. there's a verse in the Bible that's like anyone can be kind and nice to people who are mm -hmm. like you. And you know, wow. I just think about the Good Samaritan story too. Like, right. That's yeah. something I I rarely heard that story in fundamentalism mm -hmm. <laughs> ever. That's like true. This. Yeah. It was used to like prove a point, but it was never like used as like a model of mm -hmm. living. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And that's something too within fundamentalism, like not only the colonizing piece, right? Of like, you know, we have to like, here, here's a hot meal, but it comes with a caveat, right? Like, mm -hmm. but it's also built on this idea that like sameness equals like safety and difference equals danger. So, and it's a very tr like mm -hmm. us versus them mentality, which is, I think where some of like the, the strength from them comes of like, well, you know, you're different than us. So we're allowed to treat you however we want to. Right. And, um, but it is this idea that like, if you're not believing and thinking and doing what we deem is right, then you are not a safe person. Um, not only should I not spend time with you, get to know you, treat you as a human, I would say there's actually probably a case you could make that they could say, well, the Bible tells me I really don't have to give two shits about you at all, which I don't know if I can swear on this podcast, but you think about how many yeah. stories in the old Testament are, you know, God or God's people smiting, killing, pillaging, raping people that are not like them, that are not God's chosen people. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't take a brilliant person to be like, oh, well, that gives me permission 
to do that too to the people that aren't God's people, which would be anybody who doesn't believe like I do or like my group does. Mm -hmm. That can be very dangerous, but I also think we're seeing it play out. We are. And like for me, when I... When I heard the term narcissistic institution and learned about it, yeah, it just blew my mind because I'm like, these toxic religious environments, they're very narcissistic institutions. They, it has this very supremacist mindset yeah. mm-hmm. behind it. They are the best. They're the only way. And those who aren't like them are lesser than them or mm-hmm. inferior. And again, like that, like us versus them mentality and it yeah. just the high you get i guess you say the self-righteous high that you mm-hmm. get from being in the environment of like we're the saved ones we're the righteous ones and those are the bad ones these terrible things are going to happen to yeah. them but we're and it has this yeah so like we oh yeah i'm trying to remember like there was this mm, whenever i would in my teen years the rare moments when i would challenge mm. kind of my dad's own beliefs and long story short, I had bought a book that was outside of like fundamentalist ideology. And my dad yeah. was very upset, very upset mm-hmm. like about it. And so mm-hmm. he's this is his response. He's like, this person is outside our belief system. They don't have access to the Holy Spirit and they can't interpret the Bible correctly using the Holy wow. Spirit. So he was just yeah. completely dismissing or dispensing mm-hmm. of their existence, which is from Lipton's criteria for thought reform. Just like- yep. They didn't matter because they were outside the group. They were just dismissed completely. Yes. Yeah. And that's viewed as like a holy thing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like the the, it, the information control is very yeah. real inside these, these um, mm-hmm. systems. But this idea of like, I don't need anything else other than the word of God. And then maybe these like few pre-approved books by these mm-hmm. few pre-approved like pastors or whatever. Yeah. And like. Yeah, it just, it's really, it's so insulated and Mm -hmm. there's no, there's no critical thinking, but there's also then like, it makes it very difficult to talk to a person like that. I remember Mm -hmm. a family member who was like, like they were, I don't remember what the exact situation was, but it was somebody who was basically, (laughs) this is so bad, uh, but so many Christians or evangelicals, fundamentals believe this, this idea of like, if we were, you know, legalize gay marriage, then it's just like two steps away from like legalizing pedophilia and bestiality, right? Like just the most absurd. Yeah. That slippery slope fallacy, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Slippery slope. Yes, of course. And I, I was like, I I asked this person, I was like, where did you read this? Because they were like, you know, there's research on this. And I was like, where? (laughs) Like, I literally never, I'm a researcher. I have never (laughs) heard of such research. Well, it turns out it wasn't research. It was like some super fundamentalist, like Christian website. Right. And so I was like, okay, how about this? Like, I'll give you some articles, (laughs) some like actual research, some actual lived experience. I'm happy to give that to you. Um, and, and then, you know, maybe we could have a conversation and, um, the long story short is they never read it, but, but it's this idea of like, the reason that they didn't read it is because that was like, not from like the approved list, right? Like those are, we can't listen to those voices, those lived experiences. We can Mm -hmm. only listen to this limited amount that like affirms the position that we already believe. Yes. Yes. That confirmation bias. Oh my gosh. It happens so much. And like, and I'm sure I know you went to Liberty University. So (laughs) you're like, I know you're like, yes. (laughs) And me from Uh, Bob Jones. I'm like, oh, Oh. yeah. There's certain parts of my story that I like gloss over. And that's one of them. (laughs) Because I'm just like, uh, liberty. <laughs> I will say, like, and I, you know, because we're we're talking about like the biblical counseling stuff. I will say, liberty uh, is not a biblical counseling program. They they're like the legit, you know, like uh, nationally accredited. And and mm-hmm. I thought I chose them for that reason because at the point I was at in my own deconstruction process, I still was of this belief, like I have to have like my main influence has to be Christ, and then you mm-hmm. know, I but I can read some of these other books or whatever. 
Um, and I actually, you know, like comparatively, when I look at other people's programs and stuff like that, I feel like I actually did get a really good education mm-hmm. at Liberty because it was a master's degree program and it was not like in their Bible school or their theology oh, school. Oh, I see. I didn't have to take like Bible classes and things like that. There was always like a integration piece of like, how would you uh-huh. integrate this with Christ or whatever? But, <laughs> yeah. but in terms of like the baseline, so I felt very prepared. However, Mm -hmm. there is so much crap around Liberty University and just how they have really harmed people, how they exploit Mm -hmm. people, how they how the old, you know, president of the college was just so hypocritical and so just awful. Oh, yes. (laughs) When I watched that documentary. Yeah. Yep. I was just blown away by everything. And I'm checking, what is this documentary yeah. called again? If it's at the tip of my tongue. I know. I can like see it on Hulu. Um, I can't remember. Shoot. <laughs> I could look it up. Um, but I do remember like I, I was watching it with a friend of mine whenever it first came out. And um, I was like, yeah, that's oh, like, God I'm, forbid. God, God forbid. forbid. There we go. Sorry, yes. I'm like kidding. whenever Jerry Jr., uh, came into the presidency at the college. That's like, that was my first semester. So like Jerry senior had just oh died God. and he had just come in. So he'd already been involved with, cause I did the hybrid program. So I would go out to campus for classes and then I'd fly back to Minnesota and just go back and forth. And so he had already kind of like taken over that program, but then Jerry senior had died, I think one or two months, maybe before I started. And mm-hmm. then Jerry Jr. took right over. And now I'm like, I want all my money back because I know what you were doing with the money that I was paying to your school. So I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. And it was interesting because when I watched the documentary um, with my guardians who I currently live with, Mm. and um, it was interesting because I'm like, oh, I'm like, this is going to be one of those like sex scandal documentaries. (laughs) And, Not so much. <laughs> and I was shocked because, and they were quite impressed by it because of mm-hmm. how much in depth, yes, they go yeah. on like the micro level, the situation, mm-hmm. but they go on a macro level, also the politics and how yeah. this kind of thinking and this religion has mm-hmm. influenced America yeah. and our government and mm-hmm. our lives as Americans. <laughs> and I was yeah. kind of like, I love the documentary. It's incredible. Yeah. Like I thought it was, dig into. it was really well done. I thought, mm-hmm. and to that point, you know, like, I think that, you know, what so many people outside of like the fundamentalist systems don't understand is truly like how influential, uh, people like the Falwells, like Gothard, like, you know, Bob Jones, like how much Oof. influence they have had on non-Christian culture. Like yeah. when you think about like textbooks, even, you know, like there's so many that are coming from like Bob Jones that are like integrated into like mainstream textbooks and stuff like that, you know, like things that people are being taught. And you're like, that is like, that's Christian nationalism right there. Mm -hmm. Um, And so people aren't like connecting that this is not fringe. This is not, um, just those like weird Westboro Baptist people who hold signs and Mm -hmm. protest. Like this is deeply embedded into our culture currently, Mm -hmm. um, into politics, into social justice, into finances, into all sorts of legislation. Like it is embedded and it is really scary. Um, Mm -hmm. but it's so pervasive. Mm -hmm. Yes. And like something that I'm a little bit curious about you digging into more with like the dynamics of power and control, Um, because, you know, I went to Bob Jones University um, and you went to Liberty, but Mm -hmm. I think they both operated basically the same yeah, because of that, that fundamentalist Christian agenda behind it. But Mm -hmm. through the dynamics of power and control can you explain what that looked like at liberty yeah so i probably had a little bit of a different experience just because i did get to do the hybrid where i'd go on campus and i'd come mm-hmm. off and like those sorts of things i think they recognize that 
they were working with students who like in the master's degree programs, you know, we're not 20, 21, mm -hmm. we're adults, right? We have our own lives. However, we still had to like sign like a modified uh, covenant, right? Ooh, so like- Same. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just Ew. saw your break. <laughs> right? Yeah. I know. So, so it was like, it was this modified thing that they couldn't totally keep tabs on you. But there were, but because of how fundamentalism works, there's always this like, well, well, what if they find out type of thing? So it was everything from like, like the drinking rules, like the no sex before marriage, you have to be straight, all these things, right. That like definitely played out when we we're on campus, um, that we had to, you know, like had to do. I remember one night going out with two of my classmates, um, because it, uh, in this particular class, um, it was during the summer. So they didn't have like meals and stuff on campus. We'd go off campus and I was out with two of my classmates and I think they both got like an alcoholic beverage and uh -huh. I didn't drink anything at the time. Cause I was so terrified and I especially wasn't going to drink in that context. Right. Cause we're like in Lynchburg, like Liberty is literally everywhere around you. And I remember looking at them being like, uh, you know, we're not supposed to do that. And one of the guys is like, I'm 35 years old. I'm going to do whatever I want. And I remember just thinking like, I wish I had like the ability to do that, but I don't. Um, but it was, so it was like that on campus, like when we were there. And then when we, when I was home, I went to an even more fundamentalist church than Liberty was like Liberty actually was like a, a little bit less. Like uh, I remember I, re reading, I relate like, to that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, Oh, so then I'm coming home and I also can't drink because I'm working at the church in a paid. Well, I actually at that time I wasn't working at the church in a paid position. I was volunteering, but I knew like if anybody saw me out at a restaurant or this or that, I still had th that um, oversight, the surveillance culture, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the biggest things. I, I mean, I guess I can't speak for your experience at Bob Jones, but I think that one of the things that's so messy about fundamentalism that really gets to you is this idea of like, you're always being surveilled. And so yes. you never quite know, is this going to get back to the powers that be that's going to result in a lot of consequences for me? Um, and I have like, um, I think this kind of goes along with the question you're asking. It's not my exact, my exact experience, but, um, there's this idea and I can't remember like what, what generation this was in there, but it's, um, a shape called a penoctagon and they used to make prisons this way. And it's this shape that all the prison cells are like kind of in almost like a circular shape with their doors facing towards the middle and in the mm -hmm. middle of this, there's like a guard shack, um, but it has like double-sided glass. So you can't tell where the guard is looking. And they actually, in these prison systems did not ever have to lock the doors because what they, they because the, you never knew where the guard was looking. People were like, I don't, uh, I don't want to do anything. And then what started happening is the prisoners started kind of policing each other. So Ooh. I would see you do this. And so then I would get you in trouble for that or whatever. And then they would start to notice that each person was doing it to themselves. And whenever I heard about that, um, I remember thinking like, that is exactly what these fundamentalist churches and schools and systems are like, where we've got like God or the pastor in the center, but you never quite know where they're looking. And mm -hmm. so we're all busy like doing this to each other and to ourselves. And the person who's in charge is just sitting back going, look at these fools, you know, like, and, and we're doing that to each other. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know, it just, it really stuck with me. And that's how I felt at church and Liberty. <laughs> yes. And I love that you said that because I didn't want to influence your answer by saying anything from my experience. So I'm glad yeah. that I didn't say anything because yeah. Um, that's exactly how Bob mm -hmm. Jones functions. And when he says surveillance, yes. And what students say and people I've talked to, it's like, you are always being watched no matter mm -hmm. what. And like what you were saying, like you're telling on yourself and other people, like it's, we call it like the snitching system yes. that was in place. Yeah. yeah. And but that was rewarded too. Yes. Right. Because like, if you can snitch big enough on this other person, 
it actually gives you points. I mean, not literal points, but you know, like it puts you higher up because like, mm-hmm. oh, you notice the grave sin in that person's life. I remember after being kind of like out of the good graces of my church for something I had done, I knew of somebody who was doing something that was considered quote unquote worse. So mm-hmm. I turned them in and then I could be back in the good graces. Mm-hmm. Like that's so messed up. <laughs> yes. And yet that's what we are supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Switch. Yes. And at Bob Jones, it's really, it's set up in a way that if you see someone breaking the rules and you don't snitch, you're just as bad as that person yes. who broke the rule. Yes. Oh, it's mm-hmm. so messed up. It is so messed up. Oh yeah. Surveillance culture is, and, it, and even like talking about it, like it like makes my skin crawl Ooh, because I yeah. remember that feeling of like being being in that environment and, and being so terrified of every move that you make, even mistakes, right? Like there's no room for humanity. It is just like, like kill or be killed, which I know is like maybe a vulgar way of explaining it, but that Mm -hmm. is kind of how it operated. Um, it's, it was, it's really hard. You you can't ever be yourself in that environment. Yes. And so like from these environments, dealing with these toxic messages, always Mm -hmm. feeling like you're being watched and experiencing so much spiritual and religious abuse. What does healing religious Mm -hmm. trauma look like? Oh, such a big question, right? (laughs) There's like a million answers. Um, Okay. This is maybe sounds like a cop-out answer at first, but the first thing that I think is really important to emphasize is that there is no one thing that is going to work for everybody. It um and I think that's important coming out of fundamentalism because in those systems we were taught there is very specific and prescribed ways that you do every single aspect of life. And so I think coming out of those systems most of us are like just give me the prescription for healing and I'll do it. Right? <laughs> Yes. Yes. And you said that that was literally me like the first couple of weeks with my therapist. And he was like, he's like, he's like, does this sound familiar? You're going to someone for the answer to give you a formula. Mm -hmm. He's like, and like, Mm -hmm. I was like, okay. (laughs) All right. He called me out. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. 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 And so I think like to that end, not to go off on too much of a tangent, but we see a lot of people coming out of fundamentalist systems that kind of jump or hop right into another fundamentalist system, just with a different message that could be, um, something in the wellness community. It could be a political stance. It could be something with social justice. It doesn't matter what it is, but it's, it's still that rigid way of thinking and relating to others with one right answer and everything else is wrong. And so, um, I'm always wanting to be very careful when I'm talking to people that are like, okay, so how do I heal? Like, yes, I want to help you with the healing piece, but I also want to make sure that you're not looking for a prescription that is not there. Um, And I think that's really important. Now, that being said, there's many, there's many ways that I'm like, Hey, this is a really good modality or let's focus on this or that. But I will kind of hang my hat on the concept that uh, I talk about a lot called internal safety, um, or some people might call it a felt sense of safety. And the simplest way to describe that is that we can feel safe inside our bodies. The reason that's important, excuse me, is that fundamentalism is really built on denying and divorcing yourself from yourself. Right? I cannot mm-hmm. trust myself. I must doubt myself. I must assume that every desire and thought and everything is sinful and depraved and awful. And I need to outsource what's called a locus of control. I need external people, things, books, everything to tell me this is how I'm supposed to live. This is what I'm supposed to do. And if I can check each of those boxes, that is supposed to guarantee me a sense of safety in this world, as well as an eternal reward, right? Mm. So When we look at how do we heal from religious trauma, when I'm working with clients, one of the very first things that I really try to focus on, and sometimes this can take a very long time, is what we call internal safety, is saying, how can I look within myself 
to feel safe within this world. And when we can find that sense of safety, which again, sometimes takes time and there's you know ways that we do this, that then can shift how we resolve trauma, how we start to interact with ourselves and other people, how we reconstruct our identity, sexuality, grief, emotions, pleasure, all of these things. But we have to be able to get back into our body first because otherwise we're just kind of like walking dissociated heads, right? Yes, (laughs) I relate so much to that. (laughs) Oh my God, that's so accurate. Yeah, yeah. Mm Yeah. Yes. And so also, thank you for the answer though, because Mm -hmm. I know you, in the beginning, you're like, oh, this sounds like a cop-out, but I love that you recognize the nuance, the complexity of it. And I think for those who leave fundamentalist environments, and I'm saying this for myself, especially, like it's so hard to go into the outside world and be like, this isn't black and white. Mm -hmm. There isn't Mm -hmm. this one answer. But the great thing about that, though, is you get to actually learn to connect with yourself and learn Mm -hmm. who you are and learn to live with the nuances and the gray areas of life. And I think Mm -hmm. there are certain personalities that are, it's so hard to do that. And that's why I think fundamentalism tracks a certain type of personality Mm -hmm. and like way of thinking. And it's like, it's so tragic Mm -hmm. because if you don't fit into their binary system, Mm -hmm. you're screwed. Yeah, And just so much trauma from that. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that's what I've noticed so much for myself and other people. And And it's sad too, because even for my own family, I'm like, there's so much repressed trauma, trauma that's not yeah. dealt with, that's just been passed yeah. down generation mm-hmm. to generation. Mm-hmm. And it's so frustrating when you're on your healing journey and you see them mm-hmm. from a distance and you're like, yeah. I yeah. see the issues, I see the problems mm-hmm. and you'll have no idea. Mm-hmm. And I really can't tell you either because you can't deal with that. Yeah. And I think, you know, with fundamentalism, so we talked a little bit before of how like churches um, can really appeal to some basic human needs for like support Mm -hmm. and connection. Fundamentalism has appeals to our basic human needs as well. As humans, we thrive off of familiarity and feelings of certainty. And so when you spoke to that earlier, like, you know, you sit in the gray, you know, it's like uncertain. Now, I love that. I think it is so wonderful. It is my favorite to not have a crystal clear answer. I mean, well, sometimes I wish I did. But like, on you know, like in, in most situations, I love the gray space, but I had to learn to get there because fundamentalism, there is this illusion of safety. We talk about our, our nervous system feeling really dysregulated and it can feel like a bit of safety to say, here's the rules that I follow. If I just do these things, I'm going to be safe or I'm going to be connected or I'm going to be considered good or faithful or go to heaven. And that can help our nervous system feel a little bit more regulated. And so I think that fundamentalism also plays on our sense, like real human like needs, including the need for like safe connection. And I I don't know if this would be the appropriate word. I want to be careful, like tribalism of like, this is who I can stick with. Like if, if I'm with these people, I'm safe. But with that again, comes all these prescriptions and like, you have to do things in this way, because if you don't, then you're not Mm -hmm. safe and that threatens everything else. And so I think that it's really important to recognize like Part of the appeal to fundamentalism, again, is some of those real basic human needs that each of us have. And so then to move out of that can be really scary. Like you said, like, oh my gosh, I, I have to like grapple with mm-hmm. like, is, is there a right or wrong here? What if, what if there's, what if multiple truths can exist at the same time? Oh man, like, I think that sounds really cool now, but there's, there's been many times where I'm like, no, like that feels terrifying. I just want to do the right thing. And there isn't just a right thing. And so I think that's, it's important to like give, we, we can give people space and dare I say grace, (laughs) um, for like coming out of that because it is yeah. just such a different way. Like it, it can feel really, really scary. And that's again, why we go back to this internal safety thing, right? So here's this choice outside of me between these five options that all of them could be really good. And 
And, but that feels really distressing, right? I need just one crystal clear answer. Well, when I can tune into a sense of safety internally, find that calm within myself, then maybe I can make a decision that is in line with my values, even if not everybody likes it, or I can do this other thing over here, even if some people are mad. And it's, I know easier said than done, but I think that that's part of the healing process as well when we're coming out of fundamentalism. Mm, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that and explaining. Yeah, it, it really does appeal to a lot of those needs. And I think the thing about these high control religions is that you become so dependent on them for your needs. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's your friends, it's your family, sometimes it's your school, and they help you like if maybe you're like poor, they might have with money or come over and like mow your yard or something like mm -hmm. that. So it's like when you realize the harm that's mm -hmm. being done to you through like spiritual or religious abuse, it's so hard to break away. It's yeah. sometimes it's just more comfortable to repress that. Or yeah. when you hear someone else that comes to you of, oh, I'm experiencing mm -hmm. this, it's much mm -hmm. easier to gaslight or blame or minimize that yeah. person instead yeah. of because of your own personal um, experiences. Yeah. And so, you yeah. know, when you leave these environments, you know, it was interesting when I left, I'm like, you can leave fundamentalism, but the fundamentalism doesn't leave <laughs> yeah. you. Uh-huh. Yes. There's the bigger problem. <laughs> and so how do you deal and recognize that fundamentalist thinking after leaving yeah. that environment? And how do you prevent yourself from taking that to a new ideology? Mm -hmm. Such a great question. So in my book, I call that embodied fundamentalism. So that is part of how our brain and body works together. And that doesn't necessarily just apply to religious contexts. So when things happen, when messages come in, when there's experiences, the more intense or overwhelming or repeated that they are, our body develops neural pathways that send signals down to our, to our body that creates chemicals so that our body has specific responses and then messages back up to our brain. It's this nice, lovely little loop that happens. So when we deconstruct, when we come out of fundamentalism and we go, hey, this is not something that I'm interested in anymore. I'm going to start thinking differently. I'm going to evaluate this differently, reflect on this differently. That is all well and good. And I think a very important part of the healing process. But that unto itself is not healing from fundamentalism or religious trauma because that's just in your head. Your body is still trained to have these physiological responses to anything that goes against the rules of fundamentalism, whatever that might be. And so we really have to provide ourselves with opportunities to notice what's happening in our bodies and give ourselves some different experiences, provide some internal safety and a, a variety of kind of other things. But I think the way that we start to notice is by employing curiosity to your internal landscape. So what that means is um, I always like to start this in like really non-threatening ways. So this is kind of, if you follow me on social media, most people know I like The Bachelor, but they don't know why I like it. <laughs> so, and the reasons that I like mm -hmm. it have shifted over the years, yeah. but back in the day when I was really starting to deconstruct like big time, so probably 12, 13 years ago, I would watch The Bachelor and back then they didn't have podcasts, like recap podcasts, but they had recap blogs. <laughs> and so what I would do is I'd watch The Bachelor and then I would go and I'd read all of these blogs. And I started to notice that if somebody had a different opinion than what I had, I got really activated. Now, I did not have that word, like the word activated, but I noticed like my heart would race. I would start to feel a lot of shame or anger where I'd be like, oh my gosh, is there something wrong? Did I like misperceive this contestant? Did I misjudge them? Or no, that person who wrote the blog, I can't believe that they think that. And I would start to get really rigid in my thinking. And then I would find myself being like, okay, this is a, like a really dumb reality show. Like it doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> but it was that, it was that piece. It doesn't matter. That actually helped me go, hey, I need to learn how to like essentially expand my window of tolerance for people who have different opinions than I do. So I started to notice what's happening when I read this person's opinion. And can I just like take that, hold it, maybe pay attention to my breath, come back into my body or this space around me and, and realize like, 
okay, I'm here. This other person is here. Like we can have differing opinions. It's on a really non-consequential issue. This, I can still be okay. I, it's okay for me to be present in this time and space and somebody have a different opinion. So I say that as kind of like a cheeky way, like bat, the bats are helped me like deconstruct. It really did because it gave me these opportunities to grapple with that like internal tension because I was still so fundamentalist. I still believed that if anybody had a different opinion than I did, that it meant either they were wrong or I was wrong. And so I ex eventually expanded that obviously outside the bachelor, but it's looking for those ideas where I start to feel really prickly or where I start to feel like, no, there, there's a right and a wrong. I'm right. You're wrong or vice versa. It's starting to notice when do we get a little fluffed up or angry or resistant to somebody because maybe who they are, what they think, what they want is different than we do. I think those are the areas where we can start to notice mm -hmm. where is that fundamentalism still in my body? Or we might notice it like maybe you're on social media and you go, um, gosh, anybody who says something different about this particular issue, they're an unsafe person. Right. <laughs> and it's like, oh, hey, that might be the little red flag saying there's some fundamentalism there. And that's, of course, not to be like uh, promoting like there's, you know, like <laughs> that there's good in every message. Right. Like if somebody is like dispelling really toxic, you know, messaging or whatever, it's like, yeah, it's it's OK to have an opinion on that. But mm -hmm. starting to notice where the, like the rigidity is of like, you must believe this or you cannot believe this. Or we hear this in deconstruction spaces when people are like, you must deconstruct this and get to this space or you're not truly deconstructed. And I'm like, that is embodied fundamentalism. That is religion just with a different message that you're preaching. So I think those are kind of, I know that's like maybe a long-winded way of saying like, those are the answer. Those are some of the things that like we look mm -hmm. for, but we look for where there's like resistance and rigidity. And that usually tells us where the fundamentalism is still living inside us. Oof, yes. Thank you for that. I love that answer. And like you explaining how it shows up in your body and also in your thinking. And yeah. I'm I'm so sad to be getting towards the end of this interview. I know, I know. <laughs> I've enjoyed this. We could do our our sleepover with the podcast. <laughs> yeah, I'm, like, I'm like I could talk for a long time. <laughs> but I think one other piece I think I want to yeah. dig into before we end is I think it's hard for a lot of people, and it's ma maintaining relationships for those who choose. I'm maintaining relationship with those who are still in high control religious environments yeah. when you're out of it. Mm -hmm. How does, how does that work? That's hard. It's first, I just want to say that it's hard. Um, like there is no right or wrong answer because everybody is different, but it is really hard. And so I think just like giving yourself some permission to, to realize like when you're in relationship with people, and maybe this is true of you too, where there is this di dynamic where it's like difference equals danger. Um, mm -hmm. It can be hard to be in relationships with people who do believe differently because it can feel so activating. And I'm not talking about people that are just still in religion. Like when we come out of it and we still haven't addressed that fundamentalism piece, remember that the people in religion are now the dangerous ones, right? Mm -hmm. And so we both can have that. And so I think it's important to recognize like, um, like boundaries are really important. Um, of course they're easier said than done, but we might start to notice like, gosh, are there certain relationships that I need to take a step back from? Um, and maybe I can't or shouldn't cut these people out of my life entirely, but I do need to <clears throat> redefine the relationship. What is the D DTR? We need to DTR, like <laughs> define the relationship. Um, maybe it's like, um, T talking to people and saying like, Hey, you know, here's like nine different things that we can talk about and relate to and connect on. But like, I can't have these conversations with you about these things anymore. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of people who do get cut off, um, like coming out of religion. And part of the, the hardest part about that can be that their friends and family really does say like, we, we cannot speak to you again. There's a really mm, large grief yeah. process that goes with that. Um, and so that's why I say like, there is no, you know, like one answer because everybody's 
families and friends are very, very different. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I think that it's important, like what I would say is like, what do you need in order to feel safe? Um, Mm -hmm. and can that be what helps guide how your relationships go essentially and to say like, gosh, this person is so triggering or so activating to me because they will not stop talking about, you know, theology or something. And so in order for me to have a relationship with them, I can only text them Mm -hmm. and it's once a month, you know, and you go like, that's not how I want it. It's not how I hope it will always be. But at this point in my life, this is where it is. The other piece of it too, is like, I think that it's worth remembering that religion is often people's entire identity. And so when we come out of religion, like especially fundamentalist religions where difference equals danger, right? We are now the dangerous one. And so people are defensive against us. And that's really hard, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. And so I think there's, um, it, it is not justifying of any behaviors, but I think it is worth noting that those people are still, and sometimes we too are still in this spot of like, you not believing in their God or their principles or doctrines or whatever feels like a direct attack against them, which gives permission to defend themselves. And that's not fair. It's not right, but it does happen. And I think it's worth calling that out and just noting that. Um, And at the same time, on the other end of the spectrum, we can often feel the same way. This is my identity, like being an ex-evangelical, being ex-religious, being ex-Jehovah's Witness or whatever. This is now my identity. So for somebody to, you know, speak about it or question it feels threatening to me. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that it's important to recognize like how those dynamics impact us. And I think consent is another big important thing in relationships. Like Mm -hmm. just like we would not want somebody proselytizing us to try to get back into the religion. We need to be really respectful that we're not doing the same thing to them. Mm -hmm. Oof. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have enjoyed this so much. Me too. I would love to have you come back on again in the future yes. if you're down for it. Yes, oh. anytime. But thank yeah. you so much for coming on the podcast. And for people listening, yeah. you can pre-order her book. I will link yes. that below, When Religion Hurts. Please, please. I cannot wait to yeah. read it and Yay. assist I'm me so in my excited. own healing journey. Yeah. But yeah, thank mm-hmm. you again so much for coming on. Yes. Thank you for having me. I will be back on any time. I'll just like sk- schedule it out, you know, with lunch breaks and everything. And so <laughs> be an all day podcast. <laughs> awesome. Well, for everyone listening, thank you. And this was Speaking Up with Andrew Fletcher.